Howdy, if you freak out, it is Miss Cush. We are continuing. Um, I'm doing two seven and two eight in one day with my little darlings, and um, now it's time for inverses. So this is 2.8 in the curriculum. Um, unfortunately, I forgot to print it one-sided and the paper's too thin. <laughs> so first world problems, apparently. Okay, so here we go. On a specific domain, a function f has an inverse function, or they like to say is invertible. If each, okay, so if each output value is mapped onto a unique input value, okay? So because what we're about to do when we take the inverse is we're about to switch, and what was an output value becomes an input value, and what was an input value becomes an output value. Um, okay, so the domain of a function may be restricted in many ways to make the function invertible. So sometimes they'll ask the question, is this invertible? Like if I say, is y equals x squared invertible? Um, what happens here, this is y equals x squared. This function as it is over its domain, which is from negative infinity to positive infinity, it is not invertible until we restrict the domain. Okay, and so when I teach this, I stand up and hold my arms up to look like that parabola, and then I cut off an arm. Not really, but I drop an arm, and I'm like, okay, if we restrict the domain to just this piece, then I can take the inverse, and I end up getting something like this. But the qu if the question is, is y equals x squared invertible, the answer is no, because there are there are output values, like say this is y equals four, that have two input values. Okay, so here it would be at x equals two, and over here would be at x equals negative two. So if they say, if they say f of x equals x squared, and then they talk about the inverse function of f, Okay, as soon as you use function notation, you have to be a function. And so um, the inverse of this would actually include this part down here. But the inverse function would not, because that would make it not a function. So the inverse function would just be the square root of x, just this positive part right through here. Okay, um, so you have to be careful with notation. Is it invertible? No. But can I restrict the domain and find the inverse function? Yes, I can. Okay, hopefully, let's practice a few more of these and hopefully this will make sense as we keep going. Okay, um, on this next piece here, if f of a equals b, then the inverse f of b equals, the, the inverse of f, f to the negative one of b, might be how we say that, um, equals a. So basically, we have switched our x and our y's. What was an x value becomes a y value. What was a y value becomes an x value. Okay, the composition of a function f and its inverse function is the identity function. Sorry, um, that is, so basically what happens is f of its inverse of x equals the inverse of f of x. And both of these are equal to x right here, which is the identity function. And this is how we do an algebraic proof. Okay, um, I'm going to skip down to number six. That's the algebraic proof. So it says prove algebraically that these two are inverse functions. So I can do, and I called one f and I called one g. Um, so f of g of x would equal f, here's f, and then I plug in g, which was one third x plus two. When I clean this up, I get x plus six minus six, which is equal to x. Okay, I'm halfway through my proof um, because I have to do in both directions. So the other half would be that g of f of x, we have to evaluate that. g is what? One third times something plus two. What was the something? 3x minus six. A, th um, a third of three is one. So this is just one x um, minus two plus two. Well, what do you know? They're gone. Um, and I get x. And so I have therefore proven that um, these two functions are inverses. And this is, this is the algebraic proof that we're looking for. Okay. Um, there are, so now we also look at these questions here. It tells us, um, determine if f is invertible. So here's f. So what we were looking for is every output value has one. Okay, so here we have an output value of two. It has a, a value. Um, do I have any more? Hang on. Every output value has exactly one input. Did my output values repeat? No, they did not. So I see two. I see negative one. I see zero. I see one. This may have been the same table from before. Um, 
But yes, so the, is f invertible? Yes, give a reason based on the definition of, of the function. Um, the function f, has, and every output value in the function f has exactly one input value. Um, and, be, and that means, and that will give us then that the, the inverse function, every input value will have exactly one output value. Okay, so then it says create a table. Um, we're going to cheat like this. Okay. Um, the paper is just so thin this year. I don't know. I, maybe it's budget cuts. Anyway. Um, okay, so here's x. Here's g to the negative 1 of x. So what we need to do is we need to look back at our g values, and we're just going to switch our x and our y's. And so I can switch my y's, become my x's. Did you see how I took that row and wrote it in the x column? And my, and my x's become my y's. Okay. Um, I have finished this front page. I didn't write on it, but there we go. Now I'll write on the back. Okay. Um, these are my three favorite functions at this point in the year to find the inverse of um, because they're a little bit interesting. And um, uh, yeah, and then we can talk about the domain and the range and all this kind of stuff. So but to begin with this one, when we find the inverse, we're going to switch the X and Y's. Well, it's annoying when there's multiple X's. Um, so what we can do is we can switch this to, um, to vertex form. So I can complete the square. Um, this becomes x squared plus 6x plus a box. This is going to become, this is going to, um, I have plus 1. I can either add a box to the other side, but I don't really want it over there, so I can subtract a box. And so now what I have done is I have added and subtracted the same amount. Um, and so if I add 0, I haven't changed my equation. Um, so this becomes x plus 3, half of 6 is 3, 3 squared is 9, 9 goes in my box. 1 minus 9 is a negative 8. Okay, and so this is a parabola with the vertex at negative 3, negative 8. So what's the domain? Well, the domain of my quadratic is negative infinity to positive infinity. What's its range? Well, notice this is opening up since its leading coefficient is positive. And so its range is going to go from negative 8 to infinity. Well, now when it's time to find the inverse, I left space to work. Um, I'm going to switch x and y, um, but I'm going to work off of the vertex form of that equation. Watch how easy it is once I've already gotten it in this form. I'm going to add, and now it's not the only way to do this. I just think it's, it's my favorite, so I think it's the most efficient and effective. Um, okay, so I'm going to add 8. I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Usually I would do the cheer square root, square root plus minus, but then it would no longer be a function. So we don't want to do that. Um, okay, and now I'm going to subtract 3, and I get the square root of x plus 8 minus 3 is equal to y. Okay, so here's the spot to write that down. Um, it's x, the square root of x plus 8 minus 3. Um, keep in mind for my domain, I cannot take the square root of a negative. So x plus 8 has to be greater than or equal to 0. So x has to be greater than or equal to negative 8. So my domain is negative 8 to infinity. And you may notice that my domain had better match my range right here. Well, now what happens is I'm going to ask for the range of this graph. Um, and what we know is that this has been shifted to the left, 8, and down 3. So it's going something, I don't know how, it's growing, but not super fast. I, don't, I guess I should be more precise with that intercept, but... Is it above the axis? Whatever. Um, so basically, the thing I care about is that it goes as low as negative 3. Okay, um, and we want the domain to ma the domain of 1 to match the range of the other, but with this one, they didn't, um, it doesn't because this is the domain of the function. This is the domain of the function, the inverse function, which means that we had to come back here and restrict the domain. So sometimes I could say, what's the restricted domain? Well, that ends up being the range over here. Um, hopefully we'll play with this a little more and that'll make a little more sense to us. Okay, next one. This is a, a square root function. We have moved to the left three and down two. And so, we're, I don't know, that may not be drawn to scale. But the point is the domain is going to go from negative three to infinity. Its range is going to go from negative two to infinity. This is the one I call, I stand in front of the class and I make my arm go in that shape across my body and, and I call myself a one arm swimmer. Um, so the, and I feel like, and I always sound terrible. I'm like, oh, poor little guy. He's really struggling, but here he goes. And I pretend like I'm swimming. Oh, it's terrible. Um, it's rather embarrassing. Um, 
But this, do you see how it kind of looks like if my arm were across my body, which you can't see in the video, um, it looks like a one-arm swimmer. Notice on this one, um, when I, pause on that idea. Let me come back to that in a second. Let's find the inverse equation. So I'm gonna switch X and Y. I'm gonna add two. I'm gonna square both sides. I'm gonna subtract three. Okay, now this, if I were to look at this, if this were standing alone, it would have two arms. Can you see me standing in front of the class holding up both of my arms and showing you what this parabola looks like? But I didn't start with two arms. I only have one arm. And the, my expression is that you can't, I like to say you can't grow an arm. I mean, we can't. Uh, we can't grow an arm. Okay, um, and so what happens is I end up with just a piece of this parabola. It's going to go down three um, and uh, right two and down three. So it's over here and it's going something like this. Um, and so we only have, our equation is x plus two squared minus three, but the domain is restricted to just negative two to infinity. We were not able to grow an arm. We only had one arm. So when we take its inverse, we only get one arm. Okay, um, the range is pretty straightforward from the equation. We just go from negative three to infinity. Um, but this is, um, this is why I like to talk about these because our here our domain and our range have to match. You can't acquire more um, if you're, okay, here, let me say it this way. If I look at just this equation and it's standing alone, its domain is all real. But this equation over here is not standing alone. It is the inverse of G. And G came from a situation where it has a, a range that's restricted. And so if the range is restricted here, the domain has to be restricted there. Okay. My third favorite one to practice is a, a rational function, which this is a nice little review of what we, um, our last unit. Um, keep in mind, we have asymptotes where? Well, we have an asymptote from the denominator, x equals 5. We have an asymptote from the numerator, y, I lied. <laughs> from, it's the same degree, so I divide my leading coefficients and I get y equals 2. Okay, so my domain is going to be everything but that 5. My range is going to be everything um, negative infinity to 2, pick it up again, 2 to infinity. Um, if you don't believe me, um, well, I mean, don't believe me, check for yourself. But what I can do is I can come along and, and rewrite this 2, 3 with a 5, do synthetic division. That's a 2 times 5 is 10. This is 13. What I'm saying here is that this 2x plus 3 over x minus 5 would be equal to 2 plus 13 over x minus 5. Okay, what does that mean? That means my graph, my y equals, um, had a vertical stretch. Oh, don't use the word stretch. It had a vertical dilation by a factor of 13. It had a uh, horizontal translation of 5 to the right, and it had a... Um, <laughs> wow, y'all, I shouldn't make videos at the end of the day because I get tired. This is a... Um, oh. A vertical translation up to. Okay, so we had a, a vertical dilation by a factor of 13. We had a, um, we shifted right five and up two. There we go. So my asymptotes have moved to this. And if you remember, this just means we're going to be right five up two. We're here and here because we didn't have any reflections. Oh, that was a little unnecessary, but here we go. But my point was, the domain and range, the, we haven't done a ton of range problems with this, but this is just in this format, and so the range is everything except the asymptote. That was my whole point. Oh, okay. Um, so now here comes the fun part. We've got to find its um, inverse equation. Okay, I'm going to multiply both sides by y minus 5, so I get x, y minus 5x equals 2y plus 3. Um, we will use this kind of a process in other areas, so um, it's good to practice it here. I want to get everybody with a y to one side and everybody without a y to the other side. So this is xy minus 2y. I'm going to add 5x to the other side. Okay, and now I can factor out a y. And now I can divide. 
Okay, and so here's my equation. Um, 5x plus 3 over x minus 2 is the inverse function. And let's see, what are my asymptotes? Let's just double check. My asymptotes my, would be y equals divide my leading coefficients, and then x equals 2. Does that correspond to what we saw a minute ago? We had x equals 5, now we have y equals 5. We had y equals 2, now we have x equals 2. That's good news. My domain is everything but the x. So negative infinity to 2, pick it up again, 2 to infinity. Um, and that should match my range, which it does. My, um, my range should be everything except that y asymptote. Um, and that's 5 to infinity. Um, and those match right here. So that's good news. All right. Like, subscribe, comment, go practice. Let me know how I can help you. Good luck to you.